ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block, and we have a longtime friend of the show, Anton Katz, joining us on the other side of the mic, co-founder of Talos. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's been a few years. Of course, it's a pleasure. Um, it's been, I think, about two years since you last joined the program. It was right in the in the wake of of your fund uh, funding announcement with General Atlantic. I think it was a hundred and five million dollar raise that that's right helped you guys clinch that nice uh, unicorn status, if I remember correctly. You remember um, correctly. My memory's pretty good. It's all that salmon, I think. So they say. <laughs> um, so maybe for folks who are new to the audience, new to the show, walk us through the firm because it sits in an interesting and unique position in the market. It's not necessarily, um, it's almost in its own category. We can talk about that. Um, but give us the TLDR as it were. Sounds good. And yeah, Frank, thanks a lot for having me on the show. It's always awesome to talk to you outside of the show as well, uh, but it's great to be a guest on the show, and I appreciate all the help that you've given us over the years. It's been, you know, over five and a half years since we started Talos at this point, and I met you pretty much during, like, the first couple of months, like, we sat down in that, like, cafe in New York in Manhattan. Um, so thanks a lot, man. It's, it's always awesome. It's also amazing what you've been doing for the industry. Uh, so thanks for all your hard work on that. Um, listen, I mean, yeah, it's a... I don't know if Talos is on its own category, but we are definitely trying to do a couple of things differently. So Talos is a technology provider. You know, we're not your um, we're not your broker, we're not a PB, uh, we're not an exchange for sure. What we do is we provide technology to financial institutions, and those can be crypto natives or traditional financial institutions um, that want to trade crypto. That's kind of like the the, the initial premise. Um, think about it as a one stop shop, right? If uh, somebody is coming into crypto and it's uh, we don't we don't work with retail customers, of course, we we have two types of customers. We have buy side clients, which is hedge funds, proprietary trading desks, um, anybody that's trading using their own capital asset managers at this point. We have sell side customers. Those are brokers, OTC desks, banks, um, institutional brokers, retail brokers. So we have separate technologies now for both of those kind of clientels. If you're a buy side customer, you're a hedge fund, you're coming in. We give you all the tools to invest and trade crypto. So you have a portfolio management system. You can see all your assets in one place. You can see your PNL. You can see your risk. Um, we've done uh, uh, multiple acquisitions at this point, which kind of like allowed us to to really uh, beef up our offering. There, we have full execution capabilities. So we connect to all the different liquidity providers, exchanges, OTCs. We connect to DeFi, so you can execute wherever you want. We have sixty or something integrations. We have algorithmic trading, and it's the best in class at this point. We have data analytics to prove that. So you can kind of like, you know, you can see all your assets in one place. You can move your assets. You can come in and you can trade. You can clear. You can settle. We use, we connect to all the custodians, all the OTC providers, all the exchanges as I mentioned. So really that entire investment lifecycle we have. And that's if you're trading yourself. If you're offering trading capabilities to your customers, we have a brokerage out-of-the-box product that you can use. So literally, we have banks coming in and saying, like, we want to add crypto trading capabilities to our customers, and we do this globally. Or an OTC desk wants to offer crypto trading to their customers. We have ledgering, client management, P&L, settlement with your customers. Literally, the entire envelope of how you run a brokerage we have, including connectivity to your own custody, potentially connectivity to FX rails to be able to do things on the FX leg. So that's the kind of services we provide. We're a technology provider that allows these institutions, whether on the buy side or the sell side, to invest and trade crypto or to offer that to the customers. Does that make sense? It does. And I think that a lot I mean, of- obviously you know this, but- Yeah, but it, I think it'll make sense to the listeners as well. And I'm sure a lot of them can, you know, if, if they're plugged in enough and if they're paying attention to the news and to the headlines, they'll see a lot of firms mirroring the language that you're using of, of one-stop shop that that's sort of something that I, I hear a lot from different firms operating in the institutional uh, crypto market. They want to be sort of the go-to yeah. venue, the go-to conduit to the market. How would you sort of break down where different types of firms that say they're a one-stop shop fit, right? Because not everyone's necessarily doing the same exact thing. Yeah. And, and you know, like... Uh, I think there's multiple ways to look at it. Generally, when you're saying a one-stop shop, you should ask yourself, one-stop shop for who? 
Like, who is that person that's stopping at your shop and doing everything there, right? <laughs> and so, generally speaking, we play a very independent role. We are not a custodian, you know, we're not an exchange. We sit in between all those pieces. We have a single API that people can, can interact with all those underlying providers. We can have a single UI that they can use for that, right? So for us, one stop shop doesn't mean that you do everything in Talos. It doesn't mean that we will provide you with everything out of the box. We will connect all the pieces for you and we'll make it easy for you to interact with the, with the domain. We'll make it compliant. We'll make it safe. We'll make it performant. We will carry all the burden of, you, you don't have to think about how to integrate and how to work with multiple providers anymore, but they're all in the mix. The term one-stop shop used also in the industry as come here and you have everything. And that sometimes, you know, like maybe, maybe somebody saying like, come here and you have custody and execution and, and all the stuff, and it's going to be all in one place and we're all going to provide you with everything. The issue is that like that might work for clients that are either just coming into the domain and they want to kind of like, you know, dip their toe and experiment a little bit. But the minute you get to scale, you need to think about multiple providers for quite a lot of things. If you're a large financial institution, you just an institution, you generally need to think about multiple custodians. You need to think about multiple technology providers there, right? If you are doing execution, you can't really afford to only execute with a single destination. You kind of want to compete them. That's actually how capital markets work as well. Nobody's really connected to a single destination for anything. You want to have the redundancy. You want to have the choice. And so what we do is we offer that. You can come into Talos and you can say, like, I'm using, I would like to use these two custodians. I would like to use these five exchanges. And I would yes, like to use these three OTC players. For us, it's a flip of a switch. And immediately the clients start trading. We can roll out equipment within, you know, generally 12 hours. So 12 hours later, you can actually start interacting with the market. Uh, and that's that's why we're a one-stop shop. We're a one-stop shop that connects you to all those pieces. We make it easy for you to actually do this and choose the best of class, best of breed uh, system for you. How much overlap is there between a firm like Talos and uh, a firm uh, that maybe bills themselves as a prime broker? I know that it's sort of, um, this is a technology play, not a brokerage play. That I understand. But I guess if I'm thinking of myself as, let's just say, a hedge fund, um, do I need do I need both? I guess effectively is the question. Can, or can I do everything with Talos, or could I do everything with a Schmidt and Road? So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, reference. Um, generally speaking, we are not a prime. We are not the the provider of credits. We are not going to be the lender, but we do work very very closely with primes. So you're absolutely right. There are multiple clients, actually quite a few customers that come in and say like, hey, we are onboarded with Prime A, or they're asking us which Prime should we onboard with? And we say like, here, onboarded with this Prime, now you get everything. You get the credit from their side, you get the best system from our side. You can do your, all your trading, and you can do all your uh, settlement and reconciliation and all your uh, effectively lending and borrowing activity with the Prime, cross-margining. So our system actually works very, very nicely in um, uh, in contrast with uh, with the primes out there. So we are we are definitely not a prime. There's a huge, huge difference between the services we provide. We provide the technology. Primes provide the the credit and cross margining. But the the combination is really, really cool for uh, for some clients. It's a uh, it's imperative. Some clients don't use prime, but the clients that use prime, it's a really, really nice complementary uh, interaction. Yeah. So it's basically it boils down to a client's need for for credit. It's for, uh, it could be for credit, it could be for more effective uh, margin management, for instance, right? If a client is trading, uh, client is trading across multiple destinations and they really want to manage a margin in, in one place and being effectively settling with one single provider, primes play a really, really meaningful role and a very important role there. So that's, and, and our systems interact with the prime systems to be able to achieve that. Maybe we can talk about, uh, or we can double click on this one component of the business, which is unleashing crypto onto e existing uh, retail brokers. To what extent is that operating or has it penetrated um, existing equity brokerage firms? Um, there's not, there's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not a business where there's a lot of customers, but there's, but the customers that, that would be there have huge flow, huge business. So uh, really, I mean, a win would just be getting one of them. I would imagine. We have a, uh... We have, we have quite a few of them. Um, so yeah, you know, a, a big portion of the platform, especially on the sell side, that's so about half of our revenue actually comes from the uh, the sell side activities. 
And so we have uh, we have quite a few uh, retail brokerages that use Talos, and those are some of them are native, and some of them are actually traditional retail brokerages that are adding crypto capabilities. And so we provide them with that out of the box. They can literally say like, "Hey, we have uh, we are uh, let's call a United States large uh, retail brokerage, and we have uh, you know millions and then tens of millions, and sometimes more uh, generally tens of millions if it's United States clients. We want to allow them to trade crypto." We give them that capability right off the box. We they can even use our screens if they want to. But generally, if it's a if it's a broker that already has clients, they have their own experience. They have a mobile client. They have a you know um, a website that you can go to. We uh, we give them our capabilities. They can plug them into their ecosystem and start providing crypto prices, start providing trading, start accessing uh, custody. No matter what custody provider they're using, start settling with their customers. So we literally provide that kind of stuff. There's a huge demand for that. That's, uh, you know, over the past, up until I would say five months ago, for the trailing year and a half to two years, that was by far the fastest growing segment for us. Um, in the past uh, five, six months, especially since the ETF, we've also seen larger traditional uh, buy set institutions getting in. So it's, it's again, like a little bit more of a level playing field. But the sell side section, the white labeling of our platform has been an enormous selling point. So give us a sense without naming names of, of, of how many enormous players have been moving in. What, and, and you mentioned the ETF. What, did this unlock um, interest? Did it sort of pave the way for um, people who are maybe concerned about the lack of clarity from a regulatory perspective now? maybe they're comfortable to engage with, with crypto markets because yeah. uh, of these new products. So look, I mean, from a numbers perspective, I can't, I can't share numbers, but I would say this. Think about the largest quantitative asset managers and the largest buy set institutions in the United States. And, and this is true for abroad as well. Uh, but the United States has quite a few uh, uh, large ones. Um, I would say a, a very good portion of them, if you know, more than half, is doing something in crypto. We're working with a good amount of those guys. Um, and some of them are in the earlier stages of experimentation. Some of them are actually trading. Uh, and there's, I think, over the, the next like six to nine months, we're going to be hearing more and more about what those institutions are actually doing in the domain. The cool thing about them is that, you know, they have a very easy way to interact with the three vehicles effectively, with the ETF on the equities level, with the uh, derivative futures on the CME level, right? CME, like we support CME. So our clients trade CME through us uh, on CME. Uh, and now they can interact with the physical as well. So, and, and to your, the physical meaning, meaning like, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and any other assets that they choose to, to have a direct spot exposure. The, you're asking about the ETF. I think you're exactly right. I think the, that's exactly what the ETF unlocked. Part of the, you know, part of the, part of the unlock is that it's easier for traditional institutions and retail to access the, the ecosystem now, right? Because there's a ETF is a exchange traded vehicle that you can access from pretty much any brokerage platform. There's some that delisted it, but they're going to be listing it by the end of the year we here. So the ETF access is pretty easy to do. The next step is actually to trade the underlying, to trade the physical, to trade the derivative. And that's what we're seeing a lot of the institutions do. They do see the regulator. Um, providing a lot more guidance and, and clarity now than they used to before. You know, just the passing of the the fact that the ETF was approved, the Bitcoin ETF, now the Ethereum ETF was approved. It's a huge signal to institutions that the tide is changing and it's time to start looking at this. And the last thing I would say is from a portfolio construction, which is my previous world, you know, I come from uh, quantitative asset management. From portfolio construction perspective, you can't really diversify your portfolio fully when you're saying like, hey, we're going to go to crypto as a small diversification, but oh, we can only do one asset there. Like, you know, we can only like put Bitcoin. It, it's too much risk. So generally, like a lot of these institutions will likely look at the deeper bench of assets. So over the next two years, we're going to see more and more of those kind of like assets outside of the Bitcoin or Ethereum needs to be established in order to properly get into RIA, in order to get into asset management portfolios. So we're going to see that as well, and the ETF pushes you there. No, that's a really interesting point. It's 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 um, there's there's a degree of lack of clarity from a regulatory perspective that's been ameliorated, but even still, until you get some, if, until you get more assets under that fold, 
there's there's not like enough juice for the squeeze is I think the point you're making. There's 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 only really one asset for many people that they can engage with, and until yeah. there's like maybe five or six or something. Yeah, and it, it it will work for some people, but it won't work for the 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 really big diversifiers, like the people that are you know like I think uh, there's plenty of people that say diversification is is the only free game, free lunch uh, you get in in finance, and that's you know building a diversified portfolio, but it's an art, right? Like you have to really do this. And that means diversification really means that you need to have multiple assets. You need to have diversified assets. You need to protect yourself from any kind of like one thing impacting the entire portfolio or, or a big segment of the portfolio. So for some customers, they, for some larger um, clients, they will wait until they're able to, you know, properly take positions in, in multiple tokens, if you will. Uh, some will be very, very happy to go after Bitcoin because they see a strong correlation with Bitcoin with the rest of the stuff. They will be happy to go and diversify with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think that that's where, again, like RIAs, pension funds, like all those programs, they're not, they can't turn on a dime. Like the fact that you approved the ETF in January doesn't mean that like all these players are going to be trading it right now. They're building prospectuses. RIAs are like doing the, doing the education. By the end of the year is likely where we're going to see more of that activity show up. So it's, uh, you know, we're right in the beginning of the process. That That's fair. We've had a lot of, um, you're the first service provider to join the show in a, in a bit. But one thing I'm hearing is that there's 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 sort of, a you know, it's very, the market's very top heavy venture. Um, there's, there's, there's huge opportunities on the liquid side of things. Our liquid markets in crypto are super inefficient. And you don't have a lot of folks taking advantage of these opportunities. And so um, <clears throat> the market's very top heavy in that sense. It, wh what are you seeing? I mean, it would be great if some of these traditional liquid firms, uh, hedge funds from the world from which you came entered crypto, but they haven't necessarily seemed to yet. Um, do you have a sense uh, in your seat what those opportunities look like and how big of an opportunity uh, liquid is right now? Um, so I, I have a contrarian view to an extent. I do think that quite a lot of those are actually entering the market, but they do enter slowly, you know, post FTX. The one thing you can say for sure is that the compliant depart compliance departments in those organizations have a lot more teeth than they used to before when it comes to crypto, it used to be, there used to be able to wave things in to some extent because the returns were, you know, just colossal. But now when you're taking the risk into account and people's kind of you know, used to brush up risk, brush off, I'm sorry, risk. Um, today, if you take that into account, that's a meaningful thing. Like you can't interact with the counterparty where you might actually lose your funds. The most common question we get when clients are onboarding into Talos is who should I trade with? That's the, the most common question because like the trust after FTX has really been uh, impacted. So compliance plays a, a huge, huge role. And what we hear is in those kind of organizations, they're like, oh, we've been approved to do this. We've been approved to do this asset. We've been approved to go to this amount of capital that we can allocate to it. And it's really like small, small steps. So they are building the piping. A lot of them are using us, which is really cool. And they have the piping now. So they are now building the internal workflows of how to actually interact with this, how to interact with it safely. They're rolling things out a little bit. The opportunity is massive there. But I do think, you know, um, you're kind of like asking like what the, the the real opportunity in the market there's you know again like many many people trade different things there's a uh, there's still not a it's, it's not a steady market there's a lot of volatility you can trade that volatility people interact with the volatility very happily using all the derivative instruments the leverage uh, using spot instruments as well ultimately you know there's yet another leg here which at this point everybody is aware of which is crypto is a phenomenal phenomenal thing and it's an awesome opportunity. But people believe, and, and I believe as well, that digital assets as a whole present even larger opportunity and actually larger by far. So quite a lot of these asset class, and, you know, asset managers, buy side institutions, uh, larger providers as well that are getting into crypto are also in part doing that because they know that the tide is, is shifting and we are likely going to see more and more digital assets come into, come into play. We're going to see traditional assets migrate to digital assets rails. Uh, and that's our bet as well, you know. So, yeah, and so what does that mean for Talos, right? I mean, is is the future for you guys, uh, um, you know, where <clears throat> folks are trading a whole wide range of assets? It has to FX, be. FX, bonds? It has to be. This is, again, like, 
this is part of the the what we did in the past, right? We we never built system for a single asset class. It was always the the clients were, were generally the minute you start scaling up, they need to see multiple asset classes. They need to see one stop shop systems that they trade everything in. And we think that Talos can be a great conduit to allow, you know, trading of digital assets, of traditional assets on top of digital assets domain. So yes, absolutely. For us, it's, uh, you know, from, from year two, we've been talking to our investors, to our clients, to our partners, to anybody who would listen that like, listen, we're in crypto today. And if you really think about it, like the cool thing about the company is we still see it. It's been very consistent for the past four and something years. We see it in three phases. The first phase is like nail trading. Get the best thing, like roll out the best platform you can from a trading perspective. And I can tell you, like we have the best trading platform out there. And we rolled that out. The second phase is where we are today, which is provide this end-to-end trade lifecycle or investment lifecycle. That means additional systems. That means portfolio management, you know, acquisition of Cloudwall um, uh, talks about that. Portfolio constructions, that's the acquisition of D3X that we did a year ago. Um, DeFi is some of that tooling. That's the acquisition we announced last week about Skolem uh, joining the company. A lot, a lot of build went into that as well. So we now have a portfolio management system. We have execution. We have a back office. So we have reconciliation. You know, we have clearing and settlement. We have data and analytics. So really, like when you're coming in and you're saying, like, I want something, you should be able to walk that entire investment lifecycle. That's phase two for us, but that's still in crypto. Phase three is doing that across other assets. And as we see more and more traditional assets coming into digital assets domain, we're basically saying like, hey, now you can do this at Talos as well. Now you can do this at Talos as well. It's nice because we have built the systems for other asset classes our entire careers. So at this point is thinking about like, how do you build a system that will be able to address the vast majority of the use cases for our clients going forward? It's going to take time. Like this is not a next year, it's like all the assets are on digital assets, I wish, but this is really going to be a huge journey. But we're already seeing like a lot of, um, you know, a lot of signs that this is happening and there's a lot of return for that. How are you positioning yourselves uh, to take advantage of that opportunity in the in the short term? How are you adjusting for that next uh, that next wave um, or, or shift? We do uh, we do a lot of research. We uh, we do some proof of concepts, but we're predominantly speaking to our client base and, and the partners that we have to understand where the major next scale will come from in, you know, in those assets migrating. So there's plenty of experimentation going on there. If you look at every asset class, there's something going on in equities, usually in the equities back office, there's something going on fixed income, obviously effects with stable coins is a huge, huge domain. There's you, everywhere you look, I mean, there's tons of stuff, tons of activity going on in, in the Gavi sector and treasuries. We need to see the, the very first big use case and now we're working with some of the, you know, like we're fairly large at this point. We have quite a lot of institutional clients. And so we're working with some of our clients to understand like, what is the first thing that they really truly care about have being on chain that will win the, you know, like, and, and why on chain? Like, it's not that we think that ultimately a lot of things will migrate on chain, but what are the big wins that you get? Like, what is the big differentiator factor of like doing this on chain? And so we're looking at those pieces and we're, we're planning with the partners and with the investors that we have. I mean, look, we have some of the largest investors in the world. We have BNY Mellon, Fidelity, obviously GA, and recent horror with Citigroup, Wells Fargo. Like we have a lot of financial institutions that are in that conversation with us. So we're working with a lot of the players out there to, to chart the path for the actual adoption of traditional assets onto digital assets rails. That's the stuff that we do. Which assets are they sort of keen to see digitized or move to the blockchain? Generally, they're keen to see all of it, but I do think that you know things like um, things like credit, like funds, um, will be the the first to migrate. There's also a case. I mean, that's the, the fascinating thing is going to happen when we start thinking about like what's going to happen to some of the fixed income instruments. I spent a lot of time in fixed income. Of one of the previous companies that Ethan and I were uh, obviously like that's that's a, the company where we met is Broadway Technology. Broadway Technology was the largest player, one of the largest players in the fixed income. Uh, trading technology space. And it's interesting to see, you know, fixed income instruments are complex, but actually that complexity lends itself very nicely to some of the vehicles that you have here. Creating a smart contract that captures the complexity of a fixed income instrument and allows you to actually, you know, service that correctly, programmatically. We never had this kind of capabilities in capital markets. So I do think even there, I think it's going to, uh, it's going to make, a, make a play. But I really think that the, the first thing that's going to happen is going to be 
you know, uh, at scale is going to be uh, debt. Um, and debt. it's going to be, yeah, because prime issuing debt on chain is actually pretty straightforward. And there's quite a few players that have done this, but there's not connectivity yet between the primary issuers and the secondaries. We've had a ton of them on the show recently. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, you know, like, it's almost like the, the easy next step, right? You kind of like, you can represent those assets on chain. You can enable secondary trading across those assets. So I really think that that's going to be a, a, an interesting use case. Honestly, listeners of the show, I, I you know, they should be paying me because of the amount of alpha and insights that we are they not paying you? I guess I guess they do indirectly. It's a free show. <laughs> the, the show's free. I mean, anybody can listen to it. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors, of course. Um, no, this is this is super interesting. I I didn't realize that this was already on your sort of product roadmap, as it were, to expand um, beyond crypto, right? And, and it sounds like debt is sort of that first, maybe in a year or a year and a half. Next time you join the show, people will already be trading some of these instruments. But before that happens, right? I mean, crypto firms need to start eating their own lunch, like Coinbase issuing debt. They should be doing it through a platform like Figure Markets or through Max Bonin's company. I I am sure that they're thinking about this. Like you know, if there's been uh, Coinbase is is one of the best example uh, best examples of the firm that has move the industry forward in, in just like not one, but multiple domains. Even the base protocol itself is, is a great, like, look, I mean, Coinbase really do what they say they will do. They promote the sector. They have done things in DeFi. They have done things in centralized. They have done quite a lot in, in, in the custody world. And they've also been super impactful on the institutional side. I mean, who is supporting the, the, a lot of the ETF activity in the United States? Coinbase is behind all, a lot of this stuff. So Coinbase has played a tremendous role there. And I, I do believe that, you know, like if the minute we're talking about tokenization of uh, financial assets, Coinbase will likely play a role. Like we, we don't see a world where that doesn't happen. I think that's right. Well, sir. I'm not, you know, Coinbase spokesman, but I'm sure that they will say exactly the same. Listen, I, I think that you, if, if, you, if you want to moonlight us that, you have an excellent opportunity in front of you. You, you put it very eloquently. Um, we, just, we just think that it's, uh, you know, they deserve a lot of the credit. For, for, moving the, for moving the entire crypto sector forward. Yeah, I think that's fair. Sir, thanks so much for joining the program. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thanks for all the hard work, man. Of course. No, likewise. And we'll have you again. We'll have you back on again soon. I'm looking forward to it.